uh, 7.2, consideration of review and reconsideration of urgency ordinance number 3108, requiring all persons, regardless of COVID-19 vaccination status, wear face coverings in county facilities. And this was uh, brought forward by Supervisor Sabatier. Didn't know if you wanted to open up with this or? Yeah. Uh, so as uh, most of us know, should know, uh, today the state has rolled back on their uh, masking mandate. Uh, those who are vaccinated uh, are able to make the choice uh, to not wear a facial covering and those who are unvaccinated are still being requested to uh, wear a facial covering. Uh, we had created a criteria for when and so we have a our own mandate specifically for our public facilities. Um, I do want to kind of use the earlier public comment that said uh, about our mandates. Uh, that is the only mandate that we currently have from Lake County. Everything else is coming from the state. Um, and again, it only covers uh, Lake County public facilities. This does not cover any other jurisdiction. Uh, we have a criteria that if it falls below 3.9 cases per 100,000 and testing positive positivity rate falls below 4.9%, that at that point we would uh, have the discussion to uh, take that back. I wanted to have the discussion, one, because the state is changing things, uh, wanted to make sure and be clear on where we are uh, and what we're doing, but also, two, I wanted to make the argument um, that again, and I, I made the same argument before, and I'm going to provide some data to show, uh, the criteria that we used was a criteria that was taken away entirely on June 15th of 2021. I believe that was the correct date. Uh, and it was the blueprint that had been created. Uh, during that time, that blueprint is when we saw a, um, uh, a surge that definitely had some large impacts on our community. Uh, then Delta came in. It, this was created, this blueprint, prior to vaccination uh, and prior to Omicron. And I'm going to show you some data that, in my opinion, uh, provides information to show that this criteria is way too uh, restrictive for what Omicron really has been uh, through our community. So I'm going to share my screen to provide some data. And all of this data comes from CDPH. If you go to the uh, state uh, dashboard and look up Lake County and then click on um, uh, data, it's a link underneath that uh, uh, where it shows all the information for the county. And then you can get all the raw data that they have. You type in the search lake, it'll break it down to just lake, and then you can click download. And that's exactly where I got all of this information. Uh, as you can see, this information is I can move it, is all on the left-hand side. I got all the cases, I got all of the uh, deaths, and then did the seven-day average to match it up so that I can recreate the graphs that we've been seeing on our website here. Uh, and what I did on this is I decided to look at what are our surges that we've been uh, experiencing. And so our surge one, which, to be honest with you, I don't even know what it was called at that point other than just COVID, uh, we saw that happening in, this, in uh, November of 2020. And the way that I decided what a surge was, was when it exceeded 10 per 100,000 cases. Uh, I had to create some sort of criteria as to what a surge was actually defined as. Um, and so it lasted 107 days, had 2,369 cases, 35 deaths. And here's the breakdown of the daily cases average, the daily deaths average, and the death rate the death rate being 35 divided by the number of cases that we knew of uh, and when it peaked, which was 63 days. Um, currently, we're on our 50th day of our surge for Omicron, so we haven't even gone through all the way to the peak of the first surge. And as you can see already, here we have half the number of deaths per day, but yet three times the number of cases and the death rate from 1.5%, which is definitely not a good death rate, uh, to 0.23%. Uh, the flu is 0.1%. Uh, there's about 6 million people that get the flu and 60,000 people that perish from the flu, giving about approximately 0.1% death rate. Uh, so this has definitely decreased a whole lot. And our peak, as far as the number of um, 
the average cases per uh, seven days was in 30 days. So we've already hit the peak. We've been seeing a, a, it was a steep incline and now it's a steep decline, as you can see in this graph here. And so you can see all three uh, surges being highlighted on the graph. Again, those, it uh, looks exactly the same as the graph you would see on our COVID-19 data uh, that our uh, public health puts up on their page. Uh, but I wanted to kind of be able to look at uh, in, in a different way. And so what I did is I, again, grabbed the surge area and looked at the deaths as well. And you can see that during this seven day um, death average that occurred during the first surge that we had a huge peak in deaths. During the second surge, we had a very long, Delta really hurt. Uh, Delta was uh, much worse for us than any of the three. And then here for Omicron, it's been very low. Again, all deaths matter. Uh, it is very uh, personal for those that are connected, whether it's a family, whether it's friends, whether it's coworkers. Uh, I'm looking really at the data uh, in order to really apply what are we doing about this and how does this impact us. And so, again, in looking at the difference, the first surge was approximately 1.48% death rate. The second surge was approximately 1.45. We are looking at a 0.23% death rate based on the number that we have. Now, there is a caveat for Omicron is that the surge is not yet completed. We haven't dropped back below 10 cases per 100,000. Uh, so there is definitely some incomplete data to go with that. But that is the data thus far. And because the surge is not over, I decided to do some comparables so that let's look at what the first 46 days, actually that should say the first 50 days, um, of each of the surges looked like. And again, we have 0.89% death rate, 0.95% death rate, and then 0.23% death rate on Omicron. Um, again, looking at the cases, it's almost double the number of cases, but yet a whole lot lower of a death rate. Um, if we want to look at it another way, let's normalize that so that we just look at what would the whole entire surge look like if it was 50 days. And again, you still end up with the same death rate. Um, and, and you end up with less deaths and less cases overall, but you still end up with the same death rate when you normalize it by looking at uh, the statistics of it. So I'm not going to say that everything is 100% great, 0.25 is still two and a half times, or 0.23 is still 2.3 times harder on us than the flu is. We know the flu can be detrimental to those that are fragile, those that are elderly, but at the same time, we don't have any restrictions that are placed in our communities or in our public facilities because of those things. And I think that by using a tiered system that was created even prior to Delta, because Delta happened in the uh, June 29th through uh, November 15th, that uh, we can't apply a tiered system that never even knew what Omicron was versus now looking at what is happening today with the type of virus that is the majority of the issue that we're dealing with. And so I wanted to share that with you. I think it's a drastic difference in comparison, especially when you look at the death rates. Um, and again, yes, people are dying from COVID still today, and I'm very sympathetic to those that are experiencing that with their families and friends. But again, we have to look at this from a big picture perspective and what is it that we are doing. Um, the, I'm going to share a different screen real quick. Um, let me actually show you the, the bottom of my data. And so at the bottom of the data, you'll see that right now, as of today, based on all the information that we've received, we are currently at 44.43 cases per 100,000, okay, and at um, zero deaths on a seven-day average. And if I stop sharing and reshare my screen, <coughs> Let's not do that quite yet. Let's make sure I'm looking at the right thing. There we go. Okay, so you'll see on this screen 
that it says that we're at 75.5, and I just told you that we're at 44. Mm -hmm. That's because if you go on here, it's as of 2-7 of 2022. It's not as of the latest amount of information. And that's because also when you look at this and it says plus 48, that doesn't mean that 48 cases happened yesterday. It means that we're readjusting the total amount of numbers to 48 new cases. And that could be back to February 1st. That could be back to January something. It all depends when those lab results and all those that data is inputted. So we can't look at that daily and say, oh my God, we have 125 new cases. It's, it changes the entirety of some week or some days, uh, not just one single day. And so this is data that's a bit behind. Uh, there will be new data as it's introducing. But again, you can see we are absolutely falling when it comes to our seven day, and my mouse isn't quite following because I got something in front of my screen. But right here, you can see that we are absolutely decreasing at a fast rate. Everybody is exhibiting this. Uh, I was looking at every single county. You can look at different counties right here. Like, let's say, uh, let's look at Santa Barbara where there's more population. But there's Tulare already popped up. Uh, you see that same curve. You see Santa Barbara. You see that same curve. Everybody in the state of California is exhibiting that same growth spurt and that same huge cliff dropping off. Hence why the state of California, as of today, has drawn back their, uh, their masking uh, mandate, again, with that uh, caveat that unvaccinated still need to mask uh, and vaccinated can choose to. And so I wanna show you this data because the question that I think that has not been answered is when? Uh, when is the death rate acceptable enough to say that, because we, we didn't do any of these things for the flu, and right now we're at 2.25% uh, or lower, and I want to ask that we either A, follow what the state is, asking, uh, is, is doing today, and, and make that same statement for our public facilities, or B, request that public health review with this criteria that I think is impossible to achieve. Um, you, with Omicron, it's so infectious that we're gonna see cases, and we may never reach the 3.9, and yet we're, we haven't breached that criteria to say finally we're done. And so I think that we have to at least admit that we're using obsolete data in order to use that as a criteria. And I fought last time to try to get us to uh, follow the CDC criteria, uh, which is a little bit more lenient. But again, that also was created prior to Omicron. And so I just wanted to bring it to the board to see what we can do, because I think that right now we have an impossible criteria to ever meet. And we're seeing numbers that are completely drastic, drastically different than what Delta did and what the first surge did. And at one, and at, at one point, we have to eventually stop the things that we're doing and go back to normality. Is it today and follow the state, which is, again, your choice, or if you're unvaccinated, please be masked? Or do we continue and create a new criteria? Because in my opinion, continuing with what we have is not a appropriate way of evolving with the things that have changed for us and, ex and, and based on the experiences that we have. I've also spoken to both hospitals. Uh, they definitely have hit uh, full capacity during this time, but all, I was also told as a caveat that even prior to the pandemic, their hospitals would be full because that's what our hospitals are built for. They're built for the, the minimum amount of beds, uh, but they didn't have the same type of surge as they did for Delta or before where they had people in the cafeteria, where they had people going into med surge when they needed to be in ICU. And so they didn't have that same uh, issue in comparison. Um, we saw a huge number of cases, so that's why it helped stretch the hospitals a little bit. But now we're seeing that drastic drop, and it's going to keep dropping. Um, and so 
I'm, I'm gonna finish right there. I know that I did have a good conversation uh, with Director Portney uh, about what I was going to be bringing to the board today. I sent him all of my data. I did just update it with today's latest numbers that were made available. Um, and I know that he uh, shared interest in reviewing if the board does so. Uh, in directing him to review the criteria uh, to make sure that it makes public health sense with the new terms of what Omicron has been uh, shown to do. Um, and so I'll, I'll leave it there with, uh, that was my presentation. Thank you for that, uh, Supervisor Sabatier, for all the numbers and uh, for putting it out there so that uh, we have a lot of data to compare to, if that makes sense. Uh, Vice Chair Scott, you have your... your you have something to say, go ahead. I'm all for getting back to normal, but I don't think this is the time right now. I think my concern is if we still have um, employees that test positive for COVID, they're out of the workforce. And my concern would, would be that it goes around an office and then that whole office has to close and then we cannot um, provide the services that we need to the public um, because we have sick employees. Um, Honestly, I, I, I think um, California, with um, now asking for the ones that are um, not vaccinated to continue wearing masks, I think it's going to be a free-for-all and the masks are going to come off um, across the board, just like we saw back in June 15th, where we know we have a very low vaccinate, vaccinated rate, um, but when June 15th came, nobody was wearing masks anymore. And I would almost have to say those that you did see wearing masks were probably vaccinated because um, they wanted to protect um, themselves and their family. So at, at this point right now, I don't see masks being that big of a deal. I think we need to be protecting our employees, making sure we can provide services. And I, and I we may need to go back and look at our matrix and, and, and um, see how we can change those, but I, I don't think it's time for the masks to come off. Thank you, Vice Chair Scott. Mm -hmm. uh, Supervisor Paiska, you, you, have, you have your hand up. I think this has always been an issue about productivity and making sure that we can keep our doors open and keep our staff um, in place. And we have had um, big segments of departments being sent home and sick and recovering and quarantined, mm -hmm. and that's stopped. <laughs> A lot of our work dead in the tracks. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, we, we do need to look at this and luckily we've just hired a public health officer who um, his job is to help guide us on this and take that responsibility off of us and help bring that data to us to be helpful so that we can make decisions going forward. But this isn't, you know, we've been winging it for a long time um, with Dr. Pace being part-time and now that we have a dedicated PHO, I really look forward to working with him. I look forward to um, hopefully him being at our next board meeting. Um, one of the things, Supervisor Spatier, I, you know, you and I have talked about, and we talked about it with um, Dr. Bloom, is um, when you have a percentage, and I don't know exactly what it is currently today in our hospitals, a certain diagnosis taking up, say, 30% of your beds, that's too high. What is a reasonable number of COVID patients taking up our hospital space? That needs to be looked at, too. Um, so I, I, I think that public health and our new PHO can work on what the new matrix looks like for post-Omicron. Uh, but I actually reached out to seven department heads. Um, that's kind of all I had time. I picked the department heads that interact mostly with the public. And, and they all are not ready. They are experiencing um, a lot of interfacing with the public. So they're concerned about their staff who do that. They're um, concerned, like the library, they're concerned if we don't have masking in the library, then a lot of people won't come to the libraries. Um, we do have one of our department that, departments that's been hit very hard in the last two months, uh, still has um, employees testing positive and, and really fears that without masking, then they're gonna have more COVID spread within their department. I know, um, I know people are tired of wearing masks and I did hear that from one department head and, and you know, that's the reality, we're all tired of it. I think a little bit while longer, I think waiting for our new PHO, um, you know, figuring out you know, what, what is gonna be those, what are those thresholds? 
We have a very, very low vaccination rate within our staff, lower than the county, much lower than the state, and that needs to be factored into. Um, but the big thing I heard loud and clear from those directors, I can't afford to lose staff right now. I just can't. Um, those are my thoughts. I think we should wait. I, I, you know, I think we have an opportunity with Dr. McLaughlin, and I'm really looking forward to, to his leadership in this department. Thank you, Supervisor Paiska. Supervisor Simon. I just had a question for you, Supervisor Spatia. I know you said you picked up all your information from the state website, um, and we're always talking about equity and inclusion. Did you reach out to Tribal Health to look at our native community numbers? No, I did not. So once again, uh, not only at the state level, but even here at our own county level, uh, the native communities that are located here are once again just left obsc obscure. You know, they're not data. Um, and, and it's disappointing. Um, we talk about equation, you know, inclusion and equality. Uh, we did the Black History Month today. But once again, uh, you know, the native folks that are being affected here and our local government, which, yes, we, we, we don't sit and represent uh, on, on the boards. They have their own tribal nations and things. But once again, left out as non-data. It's disappointing to hear words of we want to be inclusive, we want to take everybody in, but then when you look up and you put up the California data, the native people and the indigenous ones that are here first aren't even included. And it's done right here at this board level. Uh, that's, uh, <laughs> it's all just words and it's backed up once again. And it's just, it's disappointing. Um, you know, we're in a real challenging position. I have uh, always been uh, trying to represent everybody, as I said on this board and look how we move forward. But um, it's disappointing to hear that you didn't even reach out and check on our native communities when you're look, talking about uh, getting the right data because that's not being inclusive because it isn't the right data. The native communities at this point in Lake County are being affected uh, more than any community. I don't have to look at the data to understand that, that we're a vulnerable community. We have been since the inception of this country and it continues to be that way. Um, but that's not just why I sit here on this board. But inclusion is something we talk about. We go to trainings. We do all those things. But I guess it's just words. Um, so uh, my, uh, my concern going forward is the real challenge. I've said it here before um, and many times, trying to educate the public and understand where we're going. Uh, we're in a tough spot as a board. Uh, the state lifting the mandates, obviously, on the masking. People are going to make their own choices, their own decisions as we move forward. I do agree with looking at the data, but I also see, um, you know, the writing on the wall. We're always trying to protect our workforces, make it as safe as possible. Um, but the day is coming uh, that, that people are going to make their own decisions. Just because the mask mandate for myself goes down, I still uh, am going to do what I can do to protect my family and my community members and wearing my mask. Uh, ultimately, as this board, when we make a decision either to go with the state uh, rules or come up with a different uh, metrics that we're going to be looking at as a community, um, you know, I'm, I'm willing to go either way at this point. Um, right now with the honest decision. I appreciate you bringing it, but I really got to talk about that inclusion conversation because without the data of the native folks here, it just, I just want to drive it home, especially since trainings we're just going through now of taking in everybody's account is really important. I just can't stress that enough, how important that is. And um, so at this point, uh, for me, uh, I want to do everything I can to protect our workforce, our individual communities, but we know that we've already had a problem here, even at the county level with our mandates in of people wearing masks, people have made their decisions on what they're doing, making sure that it's happening all the time and the enforcement thing is real challenging. So uh, if, you know, if there was a motion on the floor today to move forward, I, I would probably go with the, with the state mandates. I, I really would, so. And that's, that's, that's I, I, I'm only talking about following the state. I'm not talking about ignoring yeah. the state. Um, yeah. that, that would be uh, 
my job is to uh, create law, our job is to create law, and if I'm going to skirt and say certain laws I don't want to follow, then I shouldn't expect anybody to follow the ones we make. Uh, so I'm only talking about what we have currently, uh, which is set with a criteria to look at the data from the state, which is why I looked at the data from the state, um, and did not purposely ignore, uh, and it should be added in there, and unfortunately we can't even get our VA uh, to be added as well, let alone our tribal members uh, to be added in those total numbers. But our criteria is based on what we see on our public health website, which is coming directly from CDPH. And so I wanted to have a comparable to what it is that our criteria was made for. Um, but again, not asking for anything more than just the state mandate or what we have now and wanted to bring up the conversation for the fact that today things are changing outside of this facility uh, and wanted to have that conversation. Supervisor Paiska. I'm just going to mention that when the state masking mandate went into effect, our numbers were very low. Um, we always follow. Well, not all. We didn't. With Delta, we were leading the way. But, um, you know, we weren't at a place then when our numbers were very high and we were actually kind of flirting with, with the um, opportunity of, of getting to those thresholds right in the beginning of Omicron as it surged throughout the state. And let's be honest, how did that state mandate affect our county? It didn't. People did what they wanted to do. So I don't see how this day, what the state's doing, should dictate what we're doing. I think we need to look at our numbers and I think getting a, a different threshold from public health is the right direction. And giving our new PHO the chance to offer that support and leadership. Thank you, Supervisor Paiska. And thank you for uh, this dialogue. I appreciate um, everyone's in, insight into this. I look at also another thing to add because a lot of people like to talk about mandates and ordinances and uh, there was an ordinance that was done for businesses and fines and I know, and, you know we get heavily scrutinized for that however it's sunsetted so it doesn't exist anymore so I don't know if anyone thinks that that ordinance 3073 is still in effect but it is not. Um, it has sunsetted as of uh, August of last year I think or September so so that mandate, if you will, which isn't, it's just an ordinance that, uh, that specifies um, a fine listing, um, has, is gone. So um, not only does that not exist, uh, we always talk about uh, how hard it is to recruit and retain employees. And um, before this, I know in my mind, I always thought about things like, how can we make this place a more lucrative place for people to want to work despite getting paid really good? One of the things that this whole pandemic has brought to us is working from home. Um, that, that, that in some instances helps people that have children, that have limitations. Um, some people that have the freedom to not want to get sick. Um, and then we also as a board at, at, during times specific to this pandemic, have desired our employees to come back to work, putting us in a position to kind of almost contradict what we wanted to do. And so I think um, when we get discussed further, we need to really look at how, um, not only with the pandemic in mind, but also how we're going to ensure that we keep people here um, and we um, provide a place, a safe place for people to work. Because if we do go with the mandate, or not a mandate, if we go with the state's directives, there's still going to be people that say, I don't, I don't want to get sick. You know, they could wear masks, but what if they don't want to be enclosed in a room with someone they know is not vaccinated and is not careful and doesn't care? That's, that's also us putting them or them putting themselves or however you want to, you know, label it in a position to, you know, become sick. So, um, so those are just some things I think of. I also think of if we decide to keep an order in place for our, our, our workplace or you know, county buildings, if the state lifts and we keep one going, I mean, if we will allow a, a man about a gate to come to us and sue us, I'm sure there's going to be people that are going to come to us about this mask mandate. So I'm, I know Anita's looking at me because I'm bringing up something else, but I'm just giving you an example of if we keep this in place and the state lifts, what's going to take place. So. Um, Vice Chair. I, I guess my question would be, um, after today the state mandate's lifting, the courts are still going to be requiring masking, correct? So we're still going to have the fourth floor mandating masking. So I think we need to be also looking at that. How is security going to be deciphering if you're going to a county building, going to the courts, you know, where you're actually going when we're talking about this building that we're in? 
Thank you. That helps. That was my question. So I checked with the courts yesterday, and the court executive officer told me that they still plan to require masking in the court facilities, for the time being. She said. Okay. And just to uh, remind all of us that on June fifteenth, when the masking was taken away last time, the courts also still remained with masks. So uh, it's something that they had to deal with once before, and I'm sure that if it was. Uh, approved to move along to go with the state that it would be possible to figure it out. Can we get a recommendation from public health? Yes, uh, Jonathan, are you he's right there? There we go. Jonathan, if you'd like to uh, uh, join the conversation, we, we look forward to any any type of insight you would have. Yeah, very fruitful conversation. And, you know, I think that uh, we're not alone in uh, our uh, ambition to seek understanding. Uh, it seems like oftentimes when we're dealing with the federal and state uh, expectations, it takes a little bit of time to get to us, but actually, and I will say that it's going to be beneficial to um, ensure that, you know, the best practices that we put in place for our county and workforce is going to set a positive example for the health outcome of the greater county. Uh, people are looking at the health department and the you know, Board of Supervisors for Leadership, uh, which they continue to provide. Um, uh, putting the recommendation um, based on evolving events regarding mass state, or, uh, mandates, expectations around masking and various forms of shelter, I would like to receive a document around um, uh, desired expectations moving forward from the Board of Supervisors for the Department of Health to be able to consider to ensure that it is in line with the California Department of Health and Center of Disease Control expectations so that we are um, ensuring our standing uh, certification uh, for our public health department and for uh, the county's um, population health. Thank you. Does anyone have any other comments, concerns, recommendations? If not, I can go ahead and open this up to public input. See, we have some hands. Do we have anyone in the boardroom? No. Okay. Uh, the first hand we have up, Julia Bono. Um, on mute, and please uh, try to keep it to three. Um, hello, my name is Julia Bono. I have a background in scientific research. While I think math can be helpful in some, oh, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Yes, we can uh, hear you. While I think masks can be helpful in some very specific instances and should remain a personal choice, I strongly oppose mask mandates in country, county facilities, or elsewhere because a free society organized on the basis of the rights and welfare of its citizens should never inflict such an emotionally devastating policy upon its own people under the guise of protecting public health, especially when some valid scientific debate still exists as to whether or not they are actually effective in preventing the spread of the SARS-CoV-2 virus that is so minuscule it could easily pass through a standard mask. The stain of forced masking will forever live on in our memories as an unparalleled and unequivocal moral abomination this board should not continue to endorse. In my view, a society or public institution that mainstreams such abuse does not deserve to exist. I also wish to inform the board of some of the very significant harms inflicted on the physical and mental health of humans by the forced wearing of face masks. First of all, they cause physical discomfort. Wearing masks is extremely uncomfortable to many people, including children, especially those forced to wear them for seven to eight hours or more each day. Additionally, people can experience irritation or infections from face masks, as well as discomfort from the lack of oxygen and the difficulty or strain, straining of routine breathing through face masks that obstruct free airflow. Second, they amount to emotional abuse. 
Mass mandates leave many, and I'm talking about mandates here, leave many people feeling emotionally abused. This is both from the masking being forced upon them despite all the mental and emotional distress it causes, in other words, abuse, and from the constant manipulation and cruelty that is characteristic of self-righteous abusers that results from the implementation and enforcement of mask mandates. In addition, they cause a sense of helplessness. Being at the mercy of the arbitrary and capricious whims of others makes humans feel a sense of helplessness. This is extremely stressful and grueling and can eventually break a person mentally and emotionally. Furthermore, they ruin human interactions. The quality and nature of social interactions is greatly reduced. Every interaction behind masks is fundamentally different from those without masks. Interacting in this way can feel sad, despondent, isolating, cold, and or cruel, among other things. This is devastating to the human psyche and also causes intrinsic emotional distress due to having their social, intellectual, and mental development compromised as a result. Furthermore, they increase the stress and difficulty of communicating. The fr frustration that comes from difficulty communicating is underappreciated and tends to have people feeling annoyed, frustrated, and stressed. Humans have a great need for functional and efficient communication and are harmed by mask wearing because they feel they cannot learn from or communicate effectively with others. They also change your personality over time. Face masks are a radical and unnatural impingement on normal physical, mental, and emotional functioning among humans. Over time, this can change your personality. You can wrap up uh, your, your last comments, please. Less outgoing, more suspicious, decreased tendency or desire to be kind, and so on. Um, I have uh, considerably more to say, um, but I, I'm not able to say it at this time due to the time constraint. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, just to remind you, um, the, only, the only thing that's enforced is uh, in county buildings. And uh, the, the ordinance, again, has been, uh, has never really even, it never, no, no fines came to fruition. So um, again, the, don't, I think the stress level on that should be very limited. So anyhow, next uh, person I think that has their hand up, uh, Carlos Bono. You have three minutes. Hello. Um, we can hear you, but it's echoing. One moment, please. Can you hear me now? It's still echoing. Turn the other mic off. Yeah. They, they have two mics on in the is house. It, is it okay now? Yep. There you go. Okay, I want to, um, before I continue with uh, Julia Bono's um, text, I want to I want to just remind everyone that every box that contains these masks that are, you know, used, they explicitly say that they will not prevent COVID-19. So first of all, if the masks are useless, why bother? Second, why impose any kind of uh, restrictions on people that are unvaccinated when the vaccine does not prevent infection and does not uh, confer immunity? That's just absurd. Anyway, I will continue with Julia's text. Masks turn some people into abusive tyrants. Mask mandates have turned a subset of people into cruel and vicious individuals who abuse people they have power over. These might include teachers, security guards, and other overzealous individuals who incoherently screech at the sight of an unmasked person anywhere on the horizon. They give people the feeling that other people matter more. The idea that I don't matter is a distinct form of distress in addition to demonstrating a lack of fairness in society that is amplified considerably when other people matter. This is what people who are systematically disregarded tend to feel, and it is very painful. This is definitely not the sort of lesson you want your constituents getting. Masks result in distress from constant harassment. Mask mandates are a constant intrusion into personal, people's personal lives that leaves them feeling exasperated and making comments like, just leave me alone already, or just let me live in peace. It is a basic human need to not be constantly harassed by others. Kids are also very stressed from the evil mask compliance enforcer teacher, constantly haranguing them to keep their masks on all the way. Masks sap the joy from a variety of activities. Being forced to wear a stifling mask and not being able to show or see facial expressions or other hu of other humans has a tendency to reduce the enjoyment that people derive from various social activities. 
Masks cause people to live in perpetual stress from social enforcers. Inevitably, people opposed to mask mandates will not be particularly zealous about following them strictly, whether it be letting the mask slide down their face, taking it off for a few minutes here and there to breathe, or just munching on snacks. These people suffer from the baseline stress of constantly having to be alert for the mask police, whether they're actual police or just really annoying individuals or teachers who scream at mask people like the Masks cause the trauma of public humiliation. Mask police are often extremely zealous despite a lack of any overwhelming scientific basis for the efficacy of masks against the spread of a minuscule virus that can, e that can easily penetrate them. A person who won't or can't adhere to the inhumane mask requirements getting dressed down in public is now sadly a common occurrence. Public humiliation can be a traumatic experience, especially for little children who can internalize very negative ideas about themselves as a result. Anyway, this is you Carlos Bono. Thank you very much. Comments. Uh, your three minutes is expired. Okay. Thank you. It looks like nobody else in the Zoom room has uh, comments. So I'll close the Zoom room. I, it looks like. Do we have somebody from? Yes. If you can come to the microphone and state your name, and uh, I'll give you three minutes. Hi, Michael Green. Uh, I don't know which hat I'm wearing today, but um, I did want to raise, I appreciate the comments. Um, I think it's one thing to just follow the state mandate. It's also another thing to ask if the state mandate makes sense. Um, the idea that they're flipping the switch and saying unvaccinated people are still required to wear masks indoors and having any faith that that's actually going to happen is to ignore the reality that we've been living with for the last two years. I, I, for one, do not personally believe that the state policy makes sense. I'm not in any big rush to follow it. I know we're going to change at some point, and there is some need to change our masking policy. For the county work sites in particular, I say now is not that time. Having said that, I do know somewhere between two years ago and what we call normal and where we're at now, we need to carve some new ground. And I think the state is just plowing ahead toward flipping a switch and going back to whatever we were before and calling that normal. I think there's a new normal that we have not explored. And the ask uh, I'm suggesting today is knowing that COVID's going to be moving into this endemic phase from the pandemic phase, knowing that it's still going to cause risks in our county workplaces and in our schools. What can we do to be proactive, not wait for the latest, greatest state wisdom or the CDC wisdom? How can we be proactive instead of reactive? And my suggestion is to take a look where we're at with our COVID-19 policy, which right now is an add-on to our injury and illness prevention program, and explore whether we can have a follow-up to that. Uh, what would be an aerosol transmissible disease policy that would basically be a complement to the COVID-19 emergency protocols while they're in effect, but would eventually replace that. And the reason I'm suggesting that is I'm not ready to take my mask off. And a lot, I know a lot of people are not. And whether it's cold or flu season or a more serious disease like COVID, how do we protect people in the workplace? We can enshrine in a permanent policy many of these very common sense things that happen. Maybe we won't mandate masks, but I want the right to wear a mask voluntarily in the workplace. Uh, social distancing, physical distancing in the workplaces, increased ventilation. Many of the things in our emergency protocols are very doable, very practical, are not onerous in any way. And if we put it on ourselves to draft a permanent ATD policy that would keep all of our workers safe from aerosol transmissible diseases, we can get ahead of the CDC. We can get ahead of the state and say, we know where we want to go. We have a kinder, gentler, permanent policy that is going to address the spread of aerosol transmissible diseases. Maybe it would take an ad hoc committee, something like that. But I think we have enough power in the county to address that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Green. I appreciate it. Supervisor Paska? Um, I believe that CAO Hutchinson um, reached out to some other counties and did some research on what other counties are doing. And yes, uh, that's correct. Let me close public input. Well, oh, yeah, that's okay, but well, I'm closing public input, so go ahead, CAO Hutchinson. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, yeah so I participate in a... Um, web platform where other counties comment on what they're doing and so um, 
so a handful of counties were commenting on it uh, late last week and early this week. And so just to give you a sampling, in Yolo County, they said that they have a vaccine mandate in place for all county employees. So it's really a non-issue um, with the state lifting the order because all of their employees are are vaccinated so they don't have to mask. They said for the public, they asked the public to sign a self-attestation form to certify that they are vaccinated and if they do so, um, then they're allowed to enter without a mask. Monterey County is basically in the same situation uh, as we are with our, uh, what they have in place is an ordinance in county facilities only. Orange County, um, has most of their workforce remote. They, um, so it's not an issue for a lot of employees. They said that they are on a 10, they're, they're in the rain, remaining 10 months of a pilot project where their employees are largely remote. And so as far as the public is concerned, they do have the public sign a self attestation form regarding their vaccination status. In Butte County, both the public and employees are asked to sign a self-attestation form regarding their masking status. And obviously, if they're vaccinated at this point with the change uh, at the state level, they would not have to um, mask. They also said that if someone refuses to sign a self-attestation form, then they would be required to mask. And in Napa, um, in Napa, they are allowed, allowing visitors in county facilities to be maskless and they're requiring employees to do the self-attestation form. But Mendocino County is staying with their countywide mandate, is that correct? I believe so. Mendo didn't comment specific to this little survey, but I have not heard of any changes in Mendocino. Thank you for that. That actually uh, solves the uh, liability portion that I was concerned about earlier, if there was self-attestation forms, that way we can limit liability yeah. in some instances as well. And there would be a workload associated with that for sure, but um, that is one way other counties are managing. And as I mentioned earlier, I also contacted our courts that share our facility with us, and they said no change in their masking requirement for the time being, despite the fact that, that the governor is lifting the order. I thought they would go with the state guidance. Um, and then just one other small FYI in terms of um, the positive cases we're seeing among our employee ranks. Just in uh, just since this week, I, I believe I've seen um, nine positive investigations, um, meaning that employees are still getting COVID. And of those nine, two were clusters of employees in same departments. So we do teeter on the edge of uh, being operational, you know, depending on which department it is. All right. Thank you for that. Do we have anything else to go to Supervisor Sabatier? I just uh, want to add to the conversation um, the tools that we have uh, at our disposal. Nobody is forcing anybody to not wear a mask, no matter uh, what direction we choose to follow. Uh, and also, we also have the vaccine that's available to us. Uh, I'm looking again at the same data uh, at the state of California, uh, where uh, out of all of the cases that we had just in the month of January, uh, 1.7 million cases, 14.5% of those were boosted, 43% uh, were vaccinated, 42.5% were not vaccinated. It changes as we move on to hospitalizations where 9.8% of hospitalizations were boosted, 32.6% were vaccinated, and 57.6% were unvaccinated. And then when it goes to deaths, it keeps going in that same direction. 6.4% were boosted, 26.2% were vaccinated, and 67.4%. And so I think that um, we also have to recognize the tools and um, the capability to be able to be protected as well. Uh, nothing is ever going to be 100% similar to a seatbelt, uh, but there's definitely tools out there to be able to provide us uh, the greater level of safety. Um, just wanted to make sure because vaccinations were brought up and I just want to make sure that we have the right data in front of us as to how they are impacting us and protecting us. So where, where do we go from here? Uh, what, what kind of direction do we want to? So, so my goal today was to have the conversation. Again, I gave two options. Obviously, I think option A is not something that the rest of the board is looking forward to doing. Uh, but option two is our criteria is not evolved, has not evolved with what we're dealing with currently. Um, 
looking at uh, the percentages that were done even before Delta and definitely before Omicron, I think need to be regarded, updated, and, and uh, reviewed uh, by public health, not by us. Um, last time, I mean, I just randomly brought up that we used a tiered system because I didn't want to just make up a, a thing, but at the same time, uh, there was no public health right. reason to use exactly that blueprint that was months before had been uh, obsolete and canceled. Um, and I think that we do need to have something more evolved uh, with what we're dealing with. And that way we have a criteria that we can actually meet because creating a goalpost that we can never reach is also not exactly uh, an appropriate way to uh, tell people that we are looking forward to doing this when we're creating a goalpost that doesn't allow us to get to that. Um, yeah, and we now have a, a really solid public health team that can help us get through this and, and help us develop that criteria. Yeah. Time? And I definitely would agree looking at that matrix. Um, you know, the one thing that has always bothered me about the state is per 100,000, and we know I'd like that number adjusted to the, you know, the 67,000 or so that we have in the county. So when you're talking about getting it to accuracy and, and making sure those goalposts meet our needs here in the county, I think that's definitely critical to do because that 100,000, that doesn't make any sense for us because we don't even have that, that many people here in the county. So. Uh, you know, small things like that, I definitely agree. And we are moving there because people do want to be able to make their their own decisions. We want to judge that. And, and we don't want to just come to a decision where just like the state did, oh, just today we're going to do it. We want to look at that data because going down the road, knock on wood, it doesn't happen again, but we need to be prepared if it does. So, And I'm glad that you brought that up because the state is actually using the wrong numbers. They're still using our 2010 census numbers for population and not our 2020. Uh, that wasn't finalized until about 2021, but if you look at the state data, the raw data, it's using 64,000 and some odd number of people, and we know that we're at 68,000 and some odd number of people, uh, which means that our 100, uh, per 100,000 cases are elevated by three or four points, uh, which can make a difference yeah. when we're looking at 3.9, right? So it looks like uh, we would like to allow public health to, to delve into this a little further before we make any type of recommendations or mandates or anything like that. Well, I mean, I don't even like that word because we've never really tried to mandate anyone really. But um, yeah, I, I, I think we have a consensus to do that. Um, and uh, Director Portney, you have your hand up. Yeah, it would be a true honor to uh, collaborate on this and ensure the safest way. And I just want to uh, express that, uh, you know, as a health department, we want to ensure the, uh, to the best of our ability, in partnership, the health and safety of the community at large, to ensure that the systems uh, that are currently in place are supported. Um, you know, that, whether that be hospitals, schools, jails, county, even small business. Um, you know, we have, we have a lot of work to do, but, you know, as you indicated, we have a fearless uh, health department and community leaders who are ready for the task. So we look forward to working with you uh, to uh, find valuable solutions so we can move forward. Thank you. All right. Supervisor Spontier. I I'm curious, uh, the timeline so far that I've heard has been in my opinion, looking at maybe March 1st. And again, we don't even know 100%. Uh, we're hopeful that we can get our PHO started by March 1st, but that's gonna depend on the state signing off on things for us to finalize that process. Um, February 28th, I know the governor is talking about school masking mandates. Maybe that will change, maybe that will not. They will review it. That is the exact wordage that has been provided. Um, and so I'm just curious, can, can we request for this to come back to us faster than waiting for something that may not happen by March 1st? I, I feel like that, that I, and I get it, we don't have a PHO and that's been one of our uh, issues, but at the same time we do. Uh, we have Dr. Pace, we have Charlie Evans that can provide some assistance. We have Jonathan Portney, who's uh, very dedicated to the health of our communities. Uh, just kind of curious if we can move that timeline to be a little bit ahead of the game rather than being behind. 
Our next meeting's on the first. And I'd love to have it on the first, but again, if our PHO starts on right. the first, then we won't have anything to review until that gets accomplished. I really think we need a PHO to, to help uh, craft this. So I, I don't know. I, I have a hard time putting a time limit right now on it since we really don't know, you know, what our timeline looks in the future. Just ASAP, you know, as soon as we get every, all the players in place. If it has to go to the second meeting in March, I'm fine with that too. I mean, I, there is urgency on this, but we have also waited so long to have a PHO. I think making any decisions and building this out without him, yeah. it was counterproductive. I agree. And, and does that mean that, I mean, Dr. Pace is our PHO. Um, and it's not like he has to draft it. He just has to review it to make sure that it has public health uh, support. But um, on paper, we still have a PHO. Yeah. Well, they can continue to work on it. Uh, or they, I mean, I think we're giving the direction right now to start working on it. And we have most of the players and most of the pieces in place. And the current PHO can give you know, can collaborate on that too. We just start the process, but I would hate to adopt something if we don't have our PHO, our new PHO, um, giving his giving his approval on that. I think the work can start. Work can start today. Dr. Pace is also working uh, full time uh, at a couple. It's a total of full time at a couple of different locations. Um, prior to recently, he did have one day a week. He was dedicating to Lake County Public Health. He no longer has that one day a week. So I, I honestly don't know how much availability he has, although he is helping us meet the technical requirement of having a public health officer. And Dr. Evans, is, is he still with us? or? Very part-time. Dr. Evans also works full-time in an emergency room setting, and so more limited than Carrie Pace. So are we looking at the second week or the first week or just I whenever? I agree with Tina putting a date on it as soon as possible. The PHO obviously is going to uh, be starting on the first. So, you know, we are given directive to start working on it now. So get the work done that can be done and be prepared for that conversation. So that's my thoughts on it. Excellent. Okay. Excellent mean, meaning that we, I think we have a consensus as to what we'll go, what we'll go forward with. So we can move on we'll forward on the agenda. So thank you for this uh, topic of discussion. Um, would it be safe to say we can bring this back on the first agenda just to see if we're anywhere with it or, and then push it back a week or should we just let it, let it sit and wait? I think we need to wait. Yeah. I think, I think if the first is Dr. McLaughlin's first day, mm -hmm. <laughs> then that's problematic. Right. If, if he's able to start earlier, which he may, we don't know, um, then, then we could have that conversation on the first. But if the first is his first day, then I think we have to wait. All right. But I think we, we just commit to having, doing this within the first two weeks of March, as soon as, as possible. You could also just continue the item, and if there's no new information, um, because... Uh, you know, because of the doctor's status, um, it, it can just continue until they have the information and that way demonstrate the commitment to get back to the discussion. I think it's safe to say right there, we can do that. All right.